I'm prepared to take on board anything that Stephen Hawking says. Cleverest man on the planet, most brilliant scientific mind, whatever he says, gospel. That's why I took on holiday with me uh, a brief history of time. Uh, probably the wrong choice, actually. I mean, a bottle of tequila, space up, I would have done, but... Uh... <laughs> I've always felt slightly undereducated, you know, I've always been at a disadvantage. I left Bovington Gurney with a 2-2 in performing arts and a city and guilds in falconry. So, uh, <laughs> I've felt slightly disadvantaged. I've always tried to better myself. Brief history of time, right. Um, how can time have a history? Surely history is time, isn't it? And time is history, and time is an unbroken chain stretching off into the future, back into the past. And how can such a thing be brief if it is infinite. And I thought to myself, I can't even get past a title. <laughs> so I put it to one side, read a bit of Tom Clancy. Now, I don't know if you've already read any Tom Clancy. It's a little bit easier to read. Although he does have a very, very coherent world philosophy. And that is good versus evil, evil seems to get the upper hand, good triumphs with vastly superior automatic weapons. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I put it to one side, too exciting really, and uh, back to Hawking. Now, what he's describing is so vast, it's almost too much for the human brain to get your head round. He's talking about the size of our planet and the size of the star and the fact that our star, the sun in our solar system, is one of 100,000 million other stars that make up the galaxy. And this galaxy is one of 100,000 million other galaxies that make up the universe. Now that is a billion, billion things by page two. That's too many things. I can't think of a billion, billion things. <laughs> billion, billion? I don't even know when I left my keys half the time. Billion, billion? <laughs> If I think a number of things, I get to 10, 11, 12, maybe 13 things, then my eyes start to glaze over, I have to sit down and eat a Pringle sandwich. <laughs> Drawing comfort as the level bread crushes the curve of the Pringle. Crush, crush, crush. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> We've all done it. Uh, this is it. I got about, uh, I was getting in the book, I was getting really bogged down with it. And I thought, well, maybe I'm reading this book the wrong way. Maybe I'm approaching it completely the wrong way. I'm, I'm looking at it like it's a scientific textbook. I should maybe come at it from an oblique angle. Maybe lo look at it like it's a novel or something. So I, you know, take it to a meadow with a dandelion. Like, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Pretend it's a bit of lightweight melodrama or something, you know. A bit of Jane Austen, for example, there. Ah, Mr. Knightley, I am confused and not a little annoyed. It seems that even non-rotating black holes create and emit particles at a steady rate. <laughs> oh, tush and fie, Emma. Quantum mechanics tells us the particles are created just outside the black hole's event horizon. Oh, Mr. Knightley, my synapses are shutting down. <laughs> okay. sort of flows a bit better, doesn't it? Although Clancy is immeasurably improved by the Austin treatment. Oh, Mr. Darcy, I thank you for the gift of the Uzi. <laughs> My dear Elizabeth, with its lightweight barrel and high rate of fire, it is indeed one of the most sought-after light weapons in the world. <laughs> oh, Mr. Darcy, you the man. <laughs> and, uh... I got about halfway through the book and I thought, wait a second, I understood that last bit. Wait a minute. Go back a couple of pages. What did he say? He says that light is affected by gravity. <laughs> so I thought to myself, ah, what are you trying to say? That it's easier to drop things in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that, yeah. And then he'd follow it up by saying, according to Pauli's exclusion principle, if the neutron is separated from the quark, then the universe would be reduced to a rich soup, or indeed any hot beverage. <laughs> crush, 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 yum, 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 yum. <laughs> it's too much for your head to get round. There's, I mean, there's a point in the book where it just gets so abstract and out there, I just can't keep hold of it. He starts talking about the shape of the universe. Now, I can understand 
size. Yeah, it just keeps getting bigger, bigger, bigger. You just keep putting more chairs out. Yeah, I can understand that. But shape, how can it be different shapes? Icky reckons it could be three different shapes. Long and thin and flat like a piece of tagliatelle. It could be round like a giant marble on a cat's back with a bit of glitter. <laughs> or saddle shaped. Saddle shaped? You're making it up now, surely? You might as well say it is actually a saddle. It's strapped to the back of a giant cosmic donkey. God's riding it up and down a deserted galactic beach, giving it toffee apple supernovas. <laughs> I reckon at this point in the book, you just think nobody's going to get this far. I'll write any old bollocks. <laughs> ah, I'll put a word search in, a couple of puzzles, a little <laughs> dot to dot. Nobody's going to know. So I find it extraordinary, he says that even if you examine the very physical nature of the universe, like neutrons, you look at a neutron, the charge on a neutron is exactly right. It could be too much, it could be too little. But no, it's exactly right. And then the combination of gases forms life on Earth. It's as if some higher power had a neutron in a vice and was tweaking it. Went, hey, there you go, look. What do you think of that? The donkey, yeah, whatever, mate. Uh, 